What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and I love me some kata. Now, first off, I want to acknowledge that there is a long history of debate over whether kata is actually an effective way of teaching someone to fight or not. I am not going to touch that debate here, since greater minds than mine have tried and failed to bring that discussion to a close. Personally speaking, though, I enjoy training kata for a lot of different reasons, and to be quite honest, whether or not they're effective at teaching fighting techniques is pretty low on that list. They keep my at-home practice a lot more varied than simply shadowboxing any time that I want to work out, though lest you think that I'm in some way averse to shadowboxing, my boxing timer app that I use logs how much time that I've spent on that, and as of the time I wrote this, it was about 1,540 minutes over about a two-month period. Since I don't have access to a lot of weights, my at-home training basically has to cycle between shadowboxing, kata practice, and whatever I can manage to do with a kettlebell and some resistance bands, so without the variety that kata adds to my training schedule, I would surely go mad. In a previous video titled How to Interpret Kata, I discussed a theory of kata analysis known as the Kaisai no Genni. This theory was originally written down and published by Toguchi Seikichi Sensei, and was later expanded on by his student, Tamano Toshio Sensei, but it was originally developed by none other than Miyagi Chojun Sensei himself, the founder of Goju Ryu. This theory was the result both of his instruction by Higaona Kanryo Sensei, as well as his deductive and historical research on the kata themselves. Miyagi treated this theory as a closely guarded secret, only passing it on to a single student, or at least so the story goes, but this idea was the foundation both of the entirety of his style and of his unique teaching methods. Nevertheless, with the entrance of karate into the post-war modern era, the old methods of secrecy and the training of karate as a very limited pursuit by a dedicated few students were coming to an end, and even those various styles which had maintained closely guarded transmission for quite a while eventually opened up to the public. Because of this, Tokuchi sensei decided that there was no reason to keep the Kaisai no Genri a closely guarded secret. In fact, since a large number of people were now promoting their interpretation of karate as the sole legitimate view of the art, and to paraphrase Tamano Sensei's words, there were many teachers who were arbitrarily changing the katas to suit their own preferences, he felt that publicizing this theory might help to bring some sort of unity to the karate world. Obviously, more than 30 years after the initial publication of Toguchi and Tamano Sensei's writings on this theory, there hasn't yet come that sort of unity that he imagined. But part of that might be because a large number of these writings were never translated into English. In Tamano Sensei's book, Okinawa Karate Goju Ryu, he relates an interesting discovery that he made. While he had originally believed that the Kaisai no Genri was considered Mongai Fushutsu, that is to say, not allowed outside of the gates, when he read through Miyagi's Goju Ryu Kenpo, he discovered the following passage, which is also published in Karate do Gaisetsu, and which I will read for you in Japanese now. Kaishu gata wa sushu no kobo no jutsu o renketsu shitaru mono ni shite, sono kata wa sushu no enbu sen o egaki undo o nas. Shikashite, sono dousa wa jutsu no mokuteki ni teki go suru shinki to taeryoku o unyo tenkan shite, toki to musubi no genri o nattoku se shimu. The English translation that I just gave on screen is my own supplemented a little bit with Daiki Girl's translation of the similar section in Karate do Gaisetsu, which is linked in the description. What should stand out to you, though, is the phrase Toki to Musubi no Genni, which, according to Tamano Sensei and Toguchi Sensei, is an earlier name for what would later be called the Kaisai no Genni. Even this earlier and slightly longer version of the phrase was Miyagi Sensei's invention, as his teacher, Higaona Kanryo Sensei, had called this process Ti Tuchimani, a phrase which means something along the lines of try unraveling your te, or in standard Japanese, te o toite minasai. Nevertheless, despite this process supposedly being a top secret teaching of the style, here it was written for all to see, or at least named for all to see. Tamano Sensei writes that this style of writing is rather difficult to understand, and that without having heard about the Kaisai no Genri, Someone might read this passage and have no clue what it was trying to say. However, it's also undeniable that a number of other karateka, such as Mabuni Kenwa, arrived at similar conclusions based on their study of the kata. 
And the reason for this, in my opinion at least, is that most of this theory was developed either by a deductive analysis of the kata themselves, or by an historical study of how kata came to be. So finally, we're getting to the main topic of this video. Because this topic of how kata came to be is such a long one, I've decided to do something a little special with this video. I'm going to release four total videos on this topic, one for each of the stages of development that Tamano-sensei writes about kata having gone through. Each one of those videos is going to be released when it's done, so this isn't going to take up all of my uploads for the next two months. And then, once I've finalized all those videos, I'm going to release the master cut of all of them together to see whether the algorithm prefers one really long video or four smaller ones. The large video will have all of the same content as the smaller ones, so don't feel obligated to watch it if you prefer the shorter format, but I think that having it all in one video might be nice as well. And with that, there's not much else left to say now except, let's get into it.